continuing where I left off, book 11, Debaters and a Warrior Girl. When dawn came up from ocean in the east, though Pallas' death had left Ionis shaken, and duty pressed him to give time for burial of the dead, he first, in early light, discharged his ritual vows as victor to the gods. A big oak trunk, lot of its boughs, he planted on a mound, and dressed it with miscellaneous bright gear, to make a trophy, God of war to thee. He fitted it with a crest still oozing blood, with javelins of the warrior, and his cuirass, twelve times cut and breached. On the left side he tied the bronze shield, and he slung the ivory, scabbard and sword around the figure's neck. Then he addressed the officers who thronged about him in elation. One great mission stands accomplished, men. For what remains, let all our fears depart from us. I stripped the arms from a proud king, my offering now, first trophy in the war. Mesetius, become this figure at my hands. The road before us leads to the Latin town and king. Look to your gear and courage. Think ahead with good cheer of the war to come. And when, by will, the high god of our flag is raised, our troops led from the camp, nothing amiss or unforeseen will cumber or delay us. No heavy heartiness will slow us down. Meanwhile, let us give over to the earth our friends' unburied bodies the one honor possible for them now in Acheron. Go, he continued, and make beautiful the funeral rites for those heroic souls who won this land for us. Let Pallas first be sent to Evander's grieving town. He lacked it no valor when the black day took him off and sank him in death's bitterness. He wept as he said this, then made his way again to his own threshold, where the corpse of Pallas laid in care of old Akotis, once Arcadian Vander's armor-bearer, chosen under less happy auspices, to be companion of a cherished ward. There household stood round with men of Troy and Trojan women, hair abound in mourning. Then, as Aeneas entered the tall doorway, everyone there groaned mightily to heaven, beating their breasts. The prince lodge rang out with sobs and lamentation. When he saw the head at rest, the snow-white face of Pallas, the smooth chest and the open wound, the Ausanian spear had made, his tears welled up with grim words. Was it you, poor boy, that fortune would not let me keep when she came smiling? You, who were not to see our kingdom won, or ride in victory to your father's house, this was not the pledge I made, Evander, on your behalf, on leaving him. When he embraced me and gave Godspeed to my quest for my countrywide command, anxiously, too, he warned of battle with a rugged race, with savage fighting men. Even at this hour, pray to false hope, he may be making vows and heaping altars with his gifts, while here we gathered with a soldier, young and dead, who owes no vows to heaven any longer. Here is our helpless ritual and our sorrow. Father ill-fated, you will see his funeral. Can this be our return, our long for triumph? This my great pledge carried out. Enough, Evander, you will see no shameful wound of one who ran, hit from behind. You'll pray. For no hard death becomes a son lives on, disgraced. What a defense Ausonia lost. And you too, Iolus, having wept his fill, he had the forlorn body taken up for journeying, and from the army chose a thousand men to march at Vitunu, at Pallas's funeral. These would take part in mourning with his father for great pain, small consolation, but the poor king's doom. Deft hands now made a pliant beer of wicker, or brought his shoots and oak twigs interwoven, shading the piled-up couch with screens of leaves. 
Here on his rustic bed they lay the prince, most like a flower, a girl's fingers plucked it, soft petal violet, or hasteneth, with languid head, as yet not decomposed it, discomposed it, or faded, though its mother earth no longer nourishes it and makes it stand in bloom. Ionis brought two robes all stiff with gold, embroidery and purple, Dido of Sidon, herself had loved the toil of making these with her own hands one day for him in weaving golden thread into the fabric. One of these, the sorrowing man, wrapped round the prince in final honor. Then, and he spread the other, mantling the hair soon to be set aflame. He leaped the many prizes palace won in the Laurentine battle, to be borne in long file, and added mountain weapons taken into his own fight from the enemy. Then came, hands bound behind their backs, the prisoners he sent as offerings to the shades below, intending that when slain they should be due, the pyres flame with blood, and he commanded officers themselves to carry trophies. Tree trunks in foreman's gear with names attached, Asotis had to be led, far gone in age and misery, his breast stung by his blows, his cheeks torn by his nails. At times he fell, full length, flinging himself to earth. War cars they also led, a glisten with Vertulian blood. The war horse, Athian, bear of insignia, came behind with big tears rolling down to wet his cheeks. Then men who bore the spear and helm of Pallas for his belt and sword were held by Turnus the Victorious. And now the whole sad column marched it. The Trojans, all the Etruscans, the Arcanians, with arms reversed When the long file had gone, a distance on its way, Ionus halted, sighed from the heart, and spoke a final word. More of the same dreary destiny of battle calls me back to further tears. Forever hail to you, my noble friend, my palace, hail and farewell forever. That was all. Then he turned backward toward the parapets and made his way to camp. From the Latin city, spokesmen wearing chaplets of olive bows had now arrived with a petition for him. Let him give back their dead, failed by the sword, who lay upon the field. Let him permit interment of them under an earthen mound. There was no combat with defeated men who breathed the air no longer. Let him spare them, host he called them once, and father-in-laws. This request the good heart of Ionis could not spurn, but granted, and he added, What unmerited misfortune, Latins, could have embroiled you in so sad a war, that now you turn your backs on us, your friends, do you ask peace from me for those whose lives were taken by the cast of Mars? Believe me, I should have wished to grant it to the living. Never should I have come here had not fate allotted me this land for settlement. Nor do I war upon your people. No, your king dropped our alliance, let himself, instead of Turnus fighting. In all fairness, Turnus should have faced death on the field. If he would end the war by force, and drive the Trojans out. He should have fought me, fought my weapons, then the one from whom great Mars, or his own sword prevail, would have lived on. Go now, light fires beneath your wretched dead. He finished, and they stood stricken and still, turning their eyes to look at one another. Drances, an aging man, forever hostile. To the young Turnus, whom he blamed and hated, spoke and replied, Great man by fame, and proven greater in warfare, Prince of Troy, how can I match your godly nobleness with praise? Shall I admire the just man first, or first his deeds of war? Surely in gratitude will take your generous words back to our city, then, fortune willing, we shall see that you and King Latinus reunite. Let Turnus look for his own ally. Our happiness will be to raise your destined bulk of war. 
and bear the stones of Troy upon our shoulders. To this the rest, as one man spoke, assent, and so they made a twelve-day truce, while peace should hold between them Teucrians and Latins, mingling without harm as they traverse the wooden ridges. Lofty ash trees rang with strokes of double-bladed axes, pines, that towered stalwart toppled and came down, and men with wedges all day long, split oak and fragrant sedded logs or hauled, the trunks of mountain ash on groaning wings. Rumor already flown ahead in land, had heralded the mournful news. It filled Evander's ears and house his city walls, rumor that only lately had reported. Palace victorious in Latium, Arcadians crowding to the gates by night, took up the funeral torches custom called for. Flames who glare in long line move out along the road between the fields. The Phrygian column came to meet and join that line of men lamenting. When the women saw them near the walls, they made the darkened town, blazed up with wailing cries. As for Evander, nothing could hold him, but he took his way. Amid them all to where they set the bier, they threw himself on Pallas, clinging there with tears and sobs. He barely spoke at last when pain abated. This you had not promised, Pallas, telling your father with that care. You would go into action, facing Mars. I knew how ready, heady it could be to draw first blood, to taste the wine of victory in your first combat, manhood's bitter grain, war hard initiation, close at hand, my vows, my prayers unheard by any god, O oh, blessed wife so lucky in your death, not kept alive to suffer this. For my part, I, I have outlived my time to linger on, survivor of my son, would God, Rutilians, have found me side by side with Trojan troops, and pinned me to earth with spears, I should myself have given up my life. Would God, this cortege brought me, and not Pallas home. Not that I blame you or decry our compact. Trojans in our hand gripped, guest and host, this lot awaited me in my old age. But if my son had early death before him, I can rejoice that first he took the lives of countless Volskins, that he met his end, leading the Trojans into Lassium. Besides, I could not wish a funeral more noble for you, Pallas, than this one. Ionus and his piety performs with fragment leaders and Etruscan captains, all the Etruscan army. Men to whom your sword arm dealt out death are here as trophies. Great ones, you too, Turnus, would stand here. A huge trunk hung with arms, had age and strength, and seasoning of years matched him with you. But in my misery, why do I hold back? The Trojans from the war march on, remember. This my message to your king. If I live out my hateful life now, Pallas gone, your sword arm keeps me, Turnus life the death. You see it owes to father as to son. In this alone your greatness and your fortune now have scope. I ask no joy in life, I may not, but to take word to my son, far down amid the shades. Dawn at that hour brought on her kindly light for ill mankind, arousing men to labor in distress. But now Aenus and Tartan had built up their pyres long the curving shore. On them, in the old-time ritual, each bore and placed the bodies of his men. The smoky fires caught underneath and hid the face of heaven in tall gloom. Round pyres as they blazed, troop harness in bright armor marched three times in parade formation, and the cavalry swept about the sad cremation flame. Three times while calling out their desolate cries, tears fell upon the ground, fell upon armor. High in air rose the wild yells of men, the metal knell of trumpets. There was some who hurled gear taken from the Latin slain into the fire, helmets and ornate swords, and reins and chariot wheels. 
Others tossed in gifts more familiar to the dead. Their spears and shields with luck had not attended. On all sides death received burnt offering of oxen. Throats of swine were bled into the flames. With cattle camered from all the fields. Then over the whole shore they stood to see their fellow soldiers burning and kept watch on pyres as they flared. Men could not be torn from the scene till dew-drenched night came on, and a night sky, sky studded with fiery stars. The wretched Latins, also in their quarter, built countless pyres, and of their many dead they buried some, took some inland or home into the city, all the rest they burned. Heaped up in mammoth carnage, bodies jumbled, numberless and nameless, everywhere field strove with field in brightness of thick fires. A third day light in heaven of cold and gloom, before the mourners raked from the deep ash, scattered bones, and piled warmth, warm earth upon them. That day in the city within the walls of rich latinus, high pitch wailing rose, the climax of long mourning. Mothers, brides, bereft, and tender hearts of sisters grieving. Orf orphan boys, all cursed the war, the marriage, hope of Turnus. Let him fight alone, they called, and fight it out to the decision. He who demands kingship in Italy, and highest honors for himself. Then Drances gave his weight to this, fiercely avowing. Turnus alone was called to single combat. At the same time, many declare themselves in one way or another on Turnus's side. The queen's great name protected him, renowned in trophies, fairly one stood in his favor. Amid these hot exchanges, as the tumult reached its height, who should arrive in gloom one more misfortune? But the emerses, back from Diomedes City, bearing his reply, and nothing had been gained it, by all their effort and expense. Their gifts, their gold, their long entreaties had not moved him. Latins must look elsewhere for reinforcement, or ask for peace terms from the Trojan prince. Now King Latinus, at this grievous blow, lost heart. He too, for the god's anger, shown in burial mounds before his eyes had told them. Inus came as one ordained, brought by palpable will of the unseen. Therefore he called together his high consul, principal of Latium, in his court, and in all haste they came to the royal house, through the full streets, eldest among them, first in power of the scepter, grim in aspect, King Latinus took his chair, commanding those returned from the Aetolian town to tell their tales, their answers point by point. Silence being enjoined on all the rest, obediently Venilus began, we have seen Diomides, fellow townsmen, seeing the Argive camp. We made the journey, won through all the dangers, gripped the hand that brought the realm of Ulium down. We saw him, laying the foundations of his city, name Agragipa for his father's race, in Ipex country, hard by Mount Garganus. When we were in the camp, with leave to speak, before him tendering our gifts, we told what name was ours, what fatherland, what enemy made upon war upon us, and what urgent cause drew us to our pie. First he heard us out, then answered peacefully. Fortunate race and realm of Saturn, men of Osnia, what happened to disturb your quiet life and make you rouse the unknown that is war? We who did not who did violence to the alien land with cold steel. I now pass over pain and endure warfare under those high walls and soldiers that some most there holds under. All of us have paid throughout the world beyond belief in suffering for our crimes. Priam himself might pity the lot of us. Witness Minerva's deadly star and storm. You were being crags, venture the coin lights, then too. After our con conquest, driven far to strange landfalls, Menelaus tried, taste exile near the pillars of Proteus, Ulysses has become Itanian Cyclops. Ne neo Ptolemus realm, shall I tell of that, and half gods of Idomenus destroyed, of Locrians now displaced in Libya, even that marshal of the great Archians, 
the Mycenaeans entering home, met death at his unspeakable coarsen's hand. The adulterer laid in wait as Aeacus fall, and must I add all that the gods deny me, return to the altars of my fatherland, my longed for wife, Calidon's loveliness. At this hour still, portents I dread to see, pursue me, lost companion, turn to the birds, have taken to the air and roam the streams. What torture for my soldiers as they fill, the sea cliffs with their cries, their mewing cries. These punishments were all to be expected from that day when I so far lost my mind as to attack a being form in heaven, wounding, defiling Venus's hand. I'm going to leave it off there. I want to thank you for watching, and uh, I'll see you in the next video. Please give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Leave a comment below or subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.